Now, in this video, we're going to take a look at perhaps the most uh, memorable, maybe the most famous speech of the entire play. Perhaps that's debatable. There are other important speeches in the play, but this is certainly one of them. And it's one that's been referenced by uh, dozens and dozens of writers through the ages, uh, all these different aspects of this um, of this speech here by Macbeth. So this is Act 2, Scene 1. We've just had this meeting between Macbeth and Banquo. There were these you know, former uh, brothers in arms, these soldiers who fought together. Now things are very, very cagey. Um, Banquo asks him about the witches and Macbeth just kind of plays it down, says, you know, I've not thought about, I've not thought about all of that. We should talk about it sometime. Very, very cagey meeting between them. Lots of kind of veiled comments and um, inquiries. So uh, after this, uh, Banquo leaves. Macbeth is on his own and <clears throat> he is thinking very deeply about uh, everything that's happening and everything that he uh, has in front of him. And this is the famous um, a line from the speech. Is this a dagger which I see before me? So I think rather than me just uh, give my own uh, Shakespearean rendering of the speech, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to uh, a real true professional. Uh, this is Kenneth Branagh. Um, he, as far as I'm concerned, he's the number one Shakespearean actor um, in the world. He's the best Shakespearean actor that I've ever seen, including some of the old footage of uh, previous um, you know, previous uh, actors who've taken on different roles. Um, so this is a performance uh, from uh, his Macbeth in 2013. There's you know any number of notable performances from him. Um, his Hamlet, uh, which I think is available online. I actually have a DVD copy. Um, his Hamlet is probably the best production of Hamlet I've ever seen. It's just it's preposterously good. Um, it has like real heavy hitting Hollywood level actors in it as well, but like the good level Hollywood. Um, there's Kate Winslet, Charlton Heston, Gerard Depardieu, Robin Williams. It's just like an incredible, credible um, depiction and performance by Branagh in particular. And so this is him in uh, Macbeth. Uh, so let's let's listen to his rendition of the speech. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause it at various points through the video. I will leave a link in my video so you can watch the whole thing through smoothly, but I'm just going to comment once or twice on his performance and his delivery. So let's go. So we hear the hesitation in his voice. He, as he approaches, or what he believes to be, the dagger. Um, I think it's incredibly well delivered there by uh, Branagh. Very, very subtle. Uh, if you just listen to his vocal intonation, uh, the, the 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 style of speech is kind of hesitant, uh, clawing forward, uh, and un unable to really figure out what is going on. Obviously, you've got his kind of visual expression there as well. False creation proceeding from the heat of pressed brain. I see thee still in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools or the other senses, or else worth all the rest. So very, very clever here. So in this performance, we've actually got um, 
uh, we've got a holographic dagger, and you heard how his voice suddenly speed uh, suddenly sped up there, as he, you know, believes he's really seeing the dagger at this point, and obviously we as the audience are seeing it as well, and so he gets in, you know, more excited, there's less hesitancy in his voice, um, but then he kind of turns away, like, is, am I really seeing this? I see thee yet, and on thy blade and dudgeon. Gouts of blood which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs us to my eyes. Now, for the one half-world, nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch thus with his stealthy pace. So we heard a little slight um, Scottish twang in there as well. I don't know if that's just him sort of playing a bit of um, acknowledgement to obviously the character uh, and Scotland as well. With Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives, words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. Go, and it is done, the bell invites me, hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Okay, so we saw um, when he's talking about, uh, it, it was when he's talking about these sort of myth mythology and it, basically it's, there's some, it's a little bit rambly to be honest, this section, because it's depicting him, uh, his his state of mind, you see him actually physically spinning at this point. Howls his watch thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides, towards his design moves like a ghost. Okay, so we'll go, we'll come back to this. This is like a long personification. Um, but yeah, we see his kind of physical depiction. His mind is spinning, he's physically spinning around. Um, so yeah, this is Kenneth Branagh. Uh, please go and check him out. His performances are just, I think, unparalleled. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think he might be the best Shakespearean actor ever. The reason I say this is because I suspect probably nobody has studied the plays line for line to the extent that Branagh has. You know, when they were first being performed, they were being performed, you know, the actor got them on the day. Um, and so over the years, I, I suspect the quality of performances probably will have gone up over the years uh, because actors become more and more familiar and inject more and more expression and are able to get um, a more clear understanding of everything um, that is referenced in the plays. And I just think Branagh knows this stuff inside out. He just inhabits this character so brilliantly. Um, so there's my uh, plug for him. Go and check him out. Let's have a quick look through the text itself. So, um, uh, the first couple of lines there are basically sending the servant out, get thee to bed. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? So he has this physical form in front of him. Come, let me clutch thee, I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. So he's questioning, is this real? Art thou not a fat fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sound? Art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat, oppressed brain? Okay, so um, this whole section is questioning. Uh, there's some people now, you know, who look at this in a kind of modern light and say, is this a, you know, is this a sign of mental illness? Um, or is this just you know just an extreme episode of stress, or is it perhaps uh, you know actually you know, something supernatural? All three possibilities are open. Uh, I see thee yet in form as palpable as this which I now draw. 
and marshals me the way I was going, and such an instrument I was to use my eye, and made fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood. So he's seeing the blood of uh, Duncan, which was not so before. Um, there is no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. So he's skeptical about whether this is real or not. He's saying this is, you know, this is a, a figment of my imagination. Now over the half world, nature seems dead, and wicked dreams have used the curtain to sleep. Witchcraft. So there's a reference there to witchcraft, uh, potentially referencing the witches. Celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder. Alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf. So Hecate is the, uh, you know, the kind of demon god in the uh, in the play. It kind of lurks around in the background. Uh, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howl, uh, who howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Um, so we've got um, the wolf, we've got Tarquin's ravishing strides. I'm not sure about the reference to Tarquin. I've looked up a few times. It's, it's not something I think is actually that clear. Um, I'm sure there is a Shakespearean scholar who really can pin that down, but it's it's not an easy one to pin down. It's not something from you know classical literature, uh, Roman or, or Greek. I'm not sure where this comes from. Uh, moves like a ghost, so... Um, He's basically discussing here, you know, this, this is the supernatural, uh, the supernatural potential here. Um, hear not my steps, which way they walk for fear, thy very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. While I threat, he lives, words to the heat of deeds to cold breath gives. Okay, uh, let's just try and unravel this a little bit. Okay, so don't hear my steps. Um, the stones tell my whereabouts. And yeah, so this is basically, he's, he's kind of wanting to be quiet and stealthy in his approach. Words to the heat of deeds to cold breath gives. Cold breath gives words to the heat of deeds. Hmm. That is an interesting uh, link. Let me try and unravel that one. Uh, so anyway, we have a connection between deed and word here. That's essentially what we're, we're getting at here. It's this connection between action and words. Now is the time to act. There's been enough words. I go and it is done, the bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. So we have this nice rhyming emphasis at the end. And notice he ends on hell as well. Um, yeah, I go and it is done. So there's this sense that, you know, kind of fatalistic, you know, it is all over. The bell invites me. And so we have this other device as well. The bell itself is, um, you know, is a an interesting um, dramatic device. Um, some people, you know, have really made a big thing of it. There's the Ernest Hemingway book, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Um, so this is something that, I because it's it's the kind of death bell, Duncan's death bell. Um, so this is something that some uh, critics, writers. Uh, really like to focus in on. I just see it as, you know, a nice dramatic device. The bell goes, his kind of rambling stops, his thought process stops, and now it's time to act. And so I just see it as a, a dramatic device, really. Um, so that was a bit of analysis on his um, most famous uh, speech, or at least one of his most famous soliloquies in the play. Also a little bit of a commentary on uh, kind of Branagh's depiction of this scene. I thought it was a great depiction of it. Um, so uh, hopefully that's going to be something that's helpful and stimulating. Um, and yep, yeah, we've moved on now from um, Act 1 and we are really at this kind of fever pitch of tension because the great and uh, dastardly deed is about to be um, 
done, Duncan is about to meet his end. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave you there for this week and we'll catch up again soon uh, for another video um, on Macbeth. <laughs>